All right, welcome back Chemistry 111 guys. We've got an exam coming up and more practice problems to help you build your confidence. So we're gonna dive right in, knock out this answer key and hopefully get you on your way to putting some points on the bank in Friday's exam. So, okay. Now, um, what do we got here? First one, um, make sure you read the problem, right? You gotta answer both things to get full credit. It says give a short paragraph and give a drawing. In my experience, some of you forget the drawing and you lose some points unnecessarily, and that's that's never a good thing to throw away points. Nobody's uh, in such a good spot to do that these days. So let's try to keep as many points as we can. Um, so this one says, give a paragraph and a drawing uh, to, for an experiment, right? An experiment that provides evidence or data that supports the wave nature of light. Well, remember we talked about light, and light is a very complex thing. We continue to learn more and more about light even today. And light's this funky little thing where sometimes its behavior is best explained using a wave idea or wave model. But in other cases, which we'll talk about in part B, the particle uh, model or the particle uh, properties best describe it. And so we're gonna give you an example of each. Uh, these were in the notes, so I am not, nobody's got time to watch me write a paragraph, so I'm just gonna talk about it and focus more on the sketch. Well, um, if you remember, we had a light source, right? And this was the double slit experiment, which is the one that comes best to mind for me, although there are others, of course. And if you have a light source, right, and it can, it can put out, if we're thinking about it in terms of waves, right, which in this case we are, we're gonna put it out and it, we're gonna collide it into something that has two slits. And these slits have to be uh, well ordered, you know, very precise, and they have to be really small, like on the order of the wave, wavelength of light, right? And if you do that, uh, due to some awesome physics, each slit will end up acting as if it were a point source. And so it's gonna propagate waves from each of these slits. And we talked about in class, right? in the areas where these uh, waves overlap in a constructive way, you see here I'm getting these troughs are gonna overlap with troughs and peaks are gonna overlap with peaks, right? And that, if we have a screen, that's gonna give us a very, very bright spot, a very bright spot. And then this will happen in various little patterns here. And you can find your notes and find a much better picture than my terrible drawing, but you're gonna end up having these constructive areas of interference which make bright spots and then you're gonna have areas in between them where it's very very dark and that comes from the deconstructive where the peaks don't line up with peaks anymore the peaks line up with troughs and they kind of cancel each other out a little bit that's destructive interference and you get dark spots so this this pattern which can be explained using physics is really nice because it kind of gives us a good piece of experimental data to show that light does in many cases um, offer um, behavior that is best explained using a wave model of, of our theory. And so that's, that's really important. So that's the double slit experiment, very, very famous. The other one is also very famous. It was in your book, and it, it's this, this is the one where we talk about the particle nature of light. And whenever we talk about the particle nature of light, we kind of imply that we're gonna be talking about photons. These are what are called quanta, or little packets of energy, right? The idea of a photon. And this was the photoelectric effect. And this is actually in your book, so I would really urge you to go to your book and probably get a better explanation. I'm a simple person, I like simple examples, so I'm gonna to try to explain it in a simple way. Um, in a way, um, the way I draw it is I take a little piece of metal, right? We got a little metal surface. So there's some metal here. And then over it, we've got some little detector. And this detector could be as very simple as a positive electrode. And we'll talk about why it's positive in a minute. And this can be used to, you know, obviously we can hook it to something like a voltmeter and measure some voltage if we get some electrons to transfer back and forth. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a light source and we're gonna shoot this light source at the metal and you know our voltmeter initially we can look at a plot over time right we can look at the voltage over um i don't know let's look at something like wavelength i like wavelength other people use frequency i don't care it doesn't matter it's all we can always kind of interconvert them and on my axis i'm going to say i'm going to start with long long wavelength because that equals what that equals 
low energy, right? Because wavelength is inversely proportional to energy, right? If you look at energy, energy is equal to Planck's constant times frequency, right? The Greek letter nu. Um, so frequency and energy are directly proportional. However, energy is equal to uh, Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by wavelength. So wavelength is inversely proportional. That means the longer wavelengths are lower energy and the uh, short wavelengths are uh, their high energy, right? If you think about it, red light has a long wavelength, it's low energy. Blue or violet light is short wavelength, has high energy. Low energy has sm uh, small frequency, high energy has high frequency. Very good. So let's say we hit this with like red light. This is very low energy, very long wavelength. Uh, we hit this, not we're not going to really get any any electrons jumping off this metal to the detector. Really nothing happens. So our voltage stays either nothing or very, very low. And we can go from red to orange to yellow to green and then to blue. And once we get to blue or violet, I don't know. I'm just kind of making this up here. We get higher in energy and it, ultimately we break what's called the threshold energy and our voltage jumps way up. Why is that? Because the packets of energy, the photons that are hitting this metal surface, have enough energy to essentially dislodge electrons. And if these electrons get dislodged by the light, then they can jump to the detector and we can measure a voltage and that voltage will spike. And that's called, the, remember this voltage right here is called the threshold voltage or the threshold energy, excuse me. The energy required to kick off the electron because remember the electrons are bound to the metal atoms by the nucleus right the nucleus has a positive charge it holds those electrons in due to the fact that the opposites attract we talked about this in atomic structure however if we can hit this hard enough we can knock an electron off and so the book talks a little bit about the mathematics of this i'm not going to go into the math here but essentially your energy of light has to be at least larger than the threshold energy in order to kick those electrons off or you could call it the binding energy, right? The, what is the energy required to kick off an electron? That's called the binding energy, right? That's really important. So anyway, this is a really good example of the particle nature of light being best um, used to explain the phenomenon of the photoelectric effect. So make sure you go back to your book and, and review that. It's also in your notes. Okay, this next one is really easy. Again, you don't have to memorize all the wavelengths, but you should know the general regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. If you look at these, we're looking at increasing frequency, which means we're looking at increasing energy because energy and frequency, like I just talked about, are directly proportional. So in this case, which of these has the highest energy? We wanna put a three for our highest. X-rays by far are the most dangerous because they have the highest energy. If we go a little bit lower, I'd say that the heat lamp at McDonald's is infrared and then finally, the microwave oven is even longer wavelength, which means lowest energy. There we go. Now granted, don't go sticking your head in a microwave. That's dangerous as well. Um, but anyway, x-rays are by far the highest energy. We talked about that. And if you look, if you think about it, remember, uh, visible light is kind of sandwiched, right? Visible light is kind of sandwiched between infrared. It's higher the energy than infrared, but it's lower in energy than ultraviolet. So go back and look at the, the EM spectrum. I think it's, it's worth your time. Just being a aware of what we're talking about. Okay, this next one, this is a good problem because I think some of you get a little bit concerned about the mathematical problems because even though I give you the equation, sometimes I, I worry that in the heat of the moment in the exam, you build up a little bit of anxiety and if you're not confident using these equations, you might make mistakes that can lead to loss of points when you really don't want that to happen. So, okay, this first one gives us two transitions. We've got an electron, falling from n equals five energy level to n equals one within an atom. When electrons fall down, they're gonna emit electron. That's a pretty big gap, right? The delta E from five to one is pretty big. That's gonna to translate to a photon with a lot of energy. Because as the electron falls from a high energy to a low energy, it has to release in a photon that gives that much of an energy emit, that, that much energy is emitted in that photon. However, four to two, 
Granted, that's still a relaxation, the electrons falling, but 4 to 2 is nowhere near as large as 5 to 1. And if you need to prove it to yourself, go look at your reading, go look at your notes, you can see a diagram of the energy levels. 5 to 1 is a much bigger delta E. So this one has the biggest delta E. And question A asks you which one emits the highest energy? Well, that relates to the highest delta E. So that's going to be N equals 5 falling all the way down to n equals 1. No question about that. That is an easy question. What gets a little bit more difficult is then calculating. And so this one says, forget the first problem, but I just want you to calculate if an electron falls from n equals 4 to n equals 2, it's going to emit a photon. I want you to calculate the energy of that individual photon in joules. Well, that's really easy. We just use the equation from the notes where we're going to look at E. Actually, we're going to look at the delta E, the change in energy as that electron falls. And it's going to be equal to the Rydberg constant, right, which is 2.178 times 10 to the negative 18 joules, right? There's our unit joules there. And then we have to figure out where did it fall from and where did it fall to? Well, it fell to N equals 2, so that's 2 squared. Don't forget the squared, that's really important. Um, really important don't forget that and where did it start it started at 4 squared and then there we go so you take the final minus the initial squared now this this parenthetical has no units so that means this whole thing is going to be in joules and since we're doing it for an individual photon technically it's gonna be joules for photon but make sure you watch your units and if you crank that out this should be a small number which it is and I get 4.084 because we had four sig figs in the constant times 10 to the negative 19 joules. That should be a small number. If you want to, you can put joules for photon, but it already said individual photon, so we're really only worried about joules. Now you might say, wait a minute, what about two and four? Well, n equals two and n equals four, those are integers. Those are definite numbers. So those numbers have infinite sig figs. You don't worry about that, so there you go. However, this is a constant. It's measured to a certain number of decimal places. In this case, I gave you four sig figs in the constant, so you get four sig figs in your answer. All right, so this next one says, okay, um, we wanna calculate then, not joules per photon, but we wanna calculate kilojoules for a whole mole of photons. So that's gonna be a big number because a mole of anything is Avogadro's number. So we do that, we just, this is simple, this is like a, a unit conversion. So we say 4.084 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per individual photon. And then you can say, okay, well, I wanna convert from joules to kilojoules, well, that's easy. One kilojoule is equal to 1,000 joules last time I checked. And so you can cancel joules, that gives you kilojoules, you're halfway there. So now you got to get moles of photon. The way you get moles of anything is you think about Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Remember, that is a big number. In fact, happy mole day to you on Friday. I'll be celebrating mole day at 6.02 p.m. on October the 10th month of the 23rd day of the 10th month, Avogadro's number day, so that's kind of fun. I know I have no life. Thank you very much. Thanks for reminding me of that. Um, and then per mole of photons. And there you go. So now we've canceled individual photons and we're now with moles of photons, kilojoules per mole, and that is a big number. That's like 245. I'll do four sig figs. Yeah, I can do four sig figs. Uh, kilojoules per mole of photons. That is a big old whopping number. But it makes sense. If you got a mole of anything, that's going to be pretty substantial. All right, for the next two, these are really kind of simple ones, just trying to help you think about uh, you know, calculations dealing with light. And if you remember here, it says, okay, I want to calculate the wavelength. Oh, how do we do that? Well, up here we have the energy, right? The energy here, energy, remember, is equal to the Planck's constant times the frequency, nu. I talked about this a lot on the previous page. But we can also write it in terms of the wavelength, so it's going to be equal to nu times or sorry, Planck's constant times the speed of light uh, all over lambda, which is the wavelength. And we actually want to calculate, not E, we want to calculate the wavelength. So doing some very simple algebraic manipulation, I think I get something like the wavelength is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light all over the energy. 
and we can look at that and we can say okay we can go to the table uh, periodic table and data sheet we can get Planck's constant 6.626 make sure you write these numbers down correctly on an exam they can mess you up if you don't Planck's constants in joules multiply by seconds remember Planck's constant is a small number negative 34 and then we're gonna multiply it by a big old number the speed of light is 2.99 uh, what do I got here? 998. Uh, big number times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Now this is going to be cause uh, we got you've got to be really careful your units here because the problem wants it in nanometers, but it looks like we're not going to get nanometers, so we got to be careful to convert at the end. And then finally the energy that's way up here. We calculated that before. 4.084 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Now look at this, the joules will cancel, the seconds will cancel, and we're only left with meters. That means our equation is right, because wavelength is going to be in meters. And we get 4 point, I got 4.864 times 10 to the negative 7th meters. Now that makes sense, right? A meter is pretty big and light's really small. However, we want to get it in nanometers, right? And there are, what? There are... Um, 10, 1 times 10 to the 9th, here I'll write this a little bit more clearly, 1 times 10 to the 9th nanometers for every meter. It's really no different than millimeters or centimeters. Nano is just really, really small, so there's a lot of them. So if you look at negative 7 times 10 to the 9th, that's going to be a big old number. So now we get a number that makes more sense here. So 486.4 nanometers and to me that makes sense because that's about oh that's kind of like blue green light so that that's good we're in the right ballpark and the next time next question says we gotta calculate frequency that's even easier we can just use energy equals Planck's constant times nu which is the frequency we can do some very simple algebraic manipulation and we can say then since we want to solve for frequency we can say the frequency if you don't like nu you can just call it F I don't care um, it's going to be equal to what? The energy divided by Planck's constant. And we have the energy from what we calculated above. We can say it's 4.084 times 10 to the negative 19 joules all over Planck's constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules per second. Now we want to double check this because Hertz, remember what is Hertz? Hertz is cycles per second or one over seconds. And so that means joules will cancel. We'd be left with one over seconds. And I got 6.164 times 10 to the 14th Hertz. Not the car company, the frequency. There you go. Looks good. Okay. With me so far? Good. So uh, keep on going. Ah, here we go. We got some quantum number action going on here. This one's a good problem. It says circle the invalid, that means the ones that are not allowed, quantum numbers. And it shows you that it's listed them in this order. So you got to know what the quantum numbers are. So let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, we got n equals 3. That's possible. Okay, that looks good. n equals 1. Are we sorry? L equals 1. So this would be like a 3p orbital. That makes sense. m sub l is equal to negative uh, 1, 0 positive one that looks good and then uh, the electron spin can be plus or minus one half I got no problems with this one I think it's good I'll leave it one leave it as it is this next one we've got uh, n equals two that's allowed uh oh oh here's a problem n can never equal L right n can never equal L that's a problem L can only be n minus one at most so go back and look at your units here this is this is no good no good no es bueno. So that's that's a problem there. So there, that one's that one's no good. So we circle that one. Let's look at this next one. We got n equals four. That's allowed. No problem there. L equals zero. That's an s orbital. Oh, look at that m sub l. Here's a problem. If this is zero, the only value for m sub l can be zero. So this is not good. So um, in this case, you've got a violation right here. So again, remember m sub l is is not equal i'm sorry m sub l is related to l and you have to be careful so go back and look at your notes there because for if if this is an s orbital the only value for m sub l is zero so you can't have that value 
it cannot be one. So that's a that's a big problem. Okay. It looks like the air conditioner has gone out in Hayes Hall, so I hope we don't lose power and I lose this video. So it's a lot of work. I hope I don't have to start from scratch. So forgive me if the office sounds a little bit weird. I'm also losing my voice for some reason. All right, we are halfway done. Number five, Lewis structures. I love Lewis structures because you should never lose points on Lewis structures. So number one, it is a covalent ion because these are all non-metals. Nitrogen has five valence electrons and with six for each oxygen. So that's gonna be, let's see, six times three is 18. Don't forget the negative sign, so, or sorry, the anion. So that's gonna add one. So five plus one is six plus 18 is 24. You laugh at me for doing this, but <laughs> You'll rue the day you don't add these up because if you make a mistake on an exam and you count wrong or you add them up wrong, you will get these problems wrong and that will make you so sad and it'll make me sad when I take off points. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw this. We gotta be careful to and draw the resonance structures. So we've got a nitrogen, we gotta connect it to three things. That's easy enough, so that takes away six, right? That gives us 18, I believe. So let's go ahead and draw these and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I do want to see all those lone pairs on a Lewis structure on this exam, or you will lose points. Uh oh, uh, nitrogen does not have an octet, so that means we got to kick one of these off and make a double bond. Make sure we show it's a negative charge, and that looks pretty good. I like it. We need to draw all the resonance structure, but since we drew the double bond here, we could have just as easily drawn it into any one of these two down here. So we will draw a resonance structure by drawing the atoms exactly where they are. Not gonna move the atoms, we are gonna move the electrons by putting them in double bonds on a different atom. That's really important. When you draw resonance structures, you move electrons, you don't move atoms. And then of course we'll draw one more. We've got three choices here. We'll put the double bond, I think there is the option we haven't used yet. Double arrows show these are resonance structures. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, we get that done there, and we show it's a negative charge. Don't forget your negative charges, you'll lose a little point, and that's gonna be annoying, and then you'll hate me and call me bad names. Okay, so there we go, looks good. And just for funsies, I'm gonna look at this one, I'm gonna say, just double check. Okay, everything looks good, I got the right number of electrons. Again, just check your values. Make sure you got 24 electrons in all three so you don't lose points. All right, NO2 plus, oh, that's kind of a cool one. So five plus 12 minus one for a positive charge, right? That's important, this is a cation, that's kind of cool. And of course it's covalent, I should have said that. So here we go, we got uh, five plus 12 is 17 minus one, I think that is 16 even on a weeknight. And there we go, so we can draw this one and we can say, okay, well, how am I gonna do this? Well, I'm gonna put nitrogen in the middle I'm gonna put oxygen on either side. That takes away four, so that gives me 12. I'll go and give everybody an octet. Okay, that looks good, except for the fact that nitrogen's gonna be pissed off because it doesn't have an octet, so I need to maybe get rid of one here, maybe get one of one here, and now, now nitrogen's got an octet. To make sure I put that charge there. That looks good. I could draw some, I, could, I guess I could draw some bad resonance structures, but I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, I could do three over here, right? And that would be kind of funky. Still get the right number of electrons. Um, that's still gonna be a positive charge. This one did not tell us to draw uh, formal charges, so we're not gonna lose any points on that. But if I do ask you about formal charges, you should probably make sure you do an effort to include them. I bet that oxygen's not gonna be happy having a triple bond, that's no good but we'll talk about that later. So there we go, we got three resonance structures for each one. Now we can answer the question. Which ion above would contain the longest nitrogen oxygen bond distance? Well, that's good to think about, okay. So if we look at this one, if we look at all three of these structures, we see that the average nitrogen oxygen bond order is, let's see, two plus one plus one divided by three, that's four thirds, but People don't like fractions, so I'll put that as one and one third. So that's basically a bond and a third, right? And if you look at these, you got two plus one plus three. Oh, that's kind of crazy, divided by three. That's neat, the bond order, the average bond order equals, I think, two. 
That's kind of cool, right? Let me check that. 2 plus 1 is 3, plus 3 more is 6, divided by 3 is 2. Okay, so that's a, the average bond order is a, a double bond. Now, you could get really, I would be really impressed if you put your critical thinking hat on here and you say, well, wait a minute. On the nitrate, they're all equivalent structures. There's no good or bad Lewis structure. They're all the same. They're all equivalent, so I just take the average. If you're this one, I would probably say in my... You know, if I kind of look at this, I say the nitrogen's got a positive there, each of the oxygen's zero. That's pretty good. I know you don't have to do this, but it's a nice critical thinking. A single bond oxygen is a negative. Um, let's see what I got here. Uh, the nitrogen is a positive. Oxygen with three bonds? Oh my goodness, that's going to be a positive. That is not, that an oxygen's not going to be happy. Same thing down here, it's the same thing. Positive, positive, negative. I'd say these two are kind of crappy Lewis structures, and that is a scientific term, kind of crappy. It might be an SI unit. You'll have to look it up. It's worth a Google. Um, you know, if you look at these, I'd say I'd say this is pretty much the the best Lewis structure. So I'd probably say it's going to be closest to two, which is kind of what we got just by sheer luck, anyway. Um, so if you think of it, the longest one is going to be the lowest bond order, right? Because a double bond is shorter, right? Double bonds are shorter then a bond in a third. So I'm going to say the longest bond would be in O3 because it has the lowest bond order. And that's very important there. Now the next one said which bond would contain the strongest one? Well that's different. That's the opposite. That would be in O2 plus because it has the highest, right? Highest bond order. Double bonds Right? Double bonds are stronger than single bonds or bond in a third, right? So there you go. That's not so hard. Good Lewis structure drawing, good resonance there. This next one says define effective nuclear charge. Well, remember the nucleus of an atom, the number of protons, the number of protons is equal to Z. That's the nuclear charge, right? That's the nuclear charge. However, the electrons that are on the outermost shell, the valence electrons, right? The valence electrons, they don't feel that whole nuclear charge. Why is that? Because there are electrons, which we call the core electrons. And if they have negative charges, they kind of shield the nuclear charge from this valence electron. It does not feel the whole nuclear charge. So we could say, let's say this was a carbon, right? Carbon's nuclear charge is probably six because it has six protons. So we can say it's a plus six. Does this, you know, valence electron in the 2p feel a plus six? No, it's not going to feel the whole thing because these other electrons are going to be blocking it, right? They shield the nucle they shield the nucleus from or sorry, they shield the valence electron from feeling the whole uh, charge of the of the protons in the nucleus so that's shielding and basically what we're gonna feel is the electrons gonna feel not the nuclear charge but it's gonna feel the effective nuclear charge basically it's the uh, nuclear charge minus some factor due to shielding and that is gonna equal to the effective nuclear charge and so again the Z effective is always gonna be lower than the nuclear charge by itself this is again in the notes in the book, so make sure for a broader discussion you look there. And then the final thing it says, explain why it is responsible for the decrease in atomic radius as you travel from left to right across a row. And this is really important. We're talking about a row. So if you look at the second row of the pre table, right? And as you go across from like, I don't know, boron to fluorine, right? It gets smaller the radii get smaller and that's because what's happening here you're increasing the nuclear charge every time you add a proton to become a new element I hope that's important so your nuclear charge is going up now you might think well wait a minute aren't you also adding an electron so wouldn't that kind of cancel the effect out well no because it's important where you're adding that electron if you're talking about the valence shell if you're in row 2 and you're adding electrons to the 2s or the 2p you're not adding those as core, you're adding those to the valence shell. And electrons that are out here do not shield each other because they're not part of the core. Only, repeat, only core electrons contribute to shielding. 
So if you're not shielding very much and you're adding, you're dumping protons into the nucleus, that valence electron is going to feel that charge and it's going to be pulled ever so tightly closer to the nucleus, which is why it makes the overall atomic radii smaller as you go from left to right across the periodic table. We talked about that in class. It's also in your book. All right, number seven. This is just straight up electron configuration love. There's not a whole lot to this. So you got to either know it or you don't. So zinc is a transition metal. And most of the time on um, exams like this, I will make you write the entire electron configuration because I have half a soul. And so here we go. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And what I usually do there is I stop and say I have 10. And then I go to uh, you know, you should probably check though. Make sure your zinc is what? Neutral zinc is 30 electrons. It's worth a check. So there's 30. I mean, there's 30. I got 10. I got to go 20 more. And I'll say, okay, well, now I'm going to go to the next one, which is 3s2, 3p6. And so that gets me to 18, right? And then you say, okay, well, I got a ways to go still. So now I jump up to the 4s2. That gets me to 20. And then to get 10 more, I can rely on my friends in the d orbitals here. And that gets me to 30. Boom. There we go. That is the electron configuration for stable zinc. And it says, is zinc paramagnetic or diamagnetic? Well, if you look at all of these orbitals or all these subshells, they are completely filled. If they are completely filled, that means all of the electrons are paired up. If every single electron is paired up, that means it is diamagnetic, and that's really important. Paramagnetic, it only takes one electron not to have a partner to make it paramagnetic. It's really easy. It's one or the other, no in between. The last one, or this next one says, uh, give the correct electron configuration for the plus two version, the cation version of this electron configuration. Well, it's going to be exactly the same until you get to the valence shell, because the valence shell is where you mess with chemistry and bonding and charges and cation and anion formation. So we're going to go ahead and write that. And if we stop here, right, that's basically the same as argon. So that's where our abbreviation would come if I let you use it, which I probably won't. Now I'm going to go ahead and write the whole thing first. Now I've got 4s2, 3d10. These are my valence, right? And so, okay, what am I going to do? Do I take it from the 4s or do I take it from the 3d? Remember, if you're going to remove electrons, you take it from the highest n value first. Repeat, if you're going to remove electrons, you take it from the highest n value, which means you will get rid of these two electrons to make it a 2 plus, which means your new electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and 3d10. You do not touch the 3d10 until you remove all the 4s's. And then if you say for some stupid reason we're going to go to zinc 3 plus, then we would remove one from the 3D, but not until you're all done with the 4S. The 4S is always the first one to go. Do not forget that. Finally, last question, which one is larger, neutral or cation? Well, didn't we, re we removed this whole shell. If you remove a shell, you're going to get smaller. And that means then that the neutral zinc is the larger one because if you remove a whole 4s shell because you remove the electrons in them the the radius goes down cations is a general rule are always smaller than their neutral parent the opposite is true for anions because you're going to shove more electrons in there and they got to spread out because they all got negative charges they want to repel each other so that's really important again this is all in the notes i hope this is really kind of clarifying things that you're probably already aware of but you know this is really important to practice Last page, last page. We're almost done. Thanks for sticking with me here. This one is a one where you really got to read here. Um, Lewis structure. Let's do that first. Now, I always mark these off on an exam. Make sure you do them step by step. So this is covalent, right? And we'll say we got ooh eight for xenon. That's kind of cool. Four times seven is twenty-eight, which gives us thirty-four electrons. That is a lot. And we're going to draw the Lewis structure right. We're going to say, OK, I'm going to make my xenon my first one. And I've got four. One, two, three, four. And I'm going to have to bond these fluorines this way. And I'm going to say that's eight, right? So minus eight. And that's going to give me, what is that going to give me? That's going to give me 26 left. 
and I go around the horn, give everybody on the outside an octet, because that's what we do. That's how we do it. Okay. Now we had, what did I do? Six times four, it's 26. Okay, so 24, I got two left. Where are they gonna go? You guessed it, they're gonna go on Xenon. There you go. Um, oops, and I just realized that I made a big mistake, didn't I? Ah, I bet you're all pulling your hair out and say, hey, Porter's getting old, he doesn't know what he's doing. It's it's almost 11 o'clock at night, he should be in bed. And sure enough, I should, because guess what? Eight plus 28 is not 34, Porter, you're an idiot. It's 36, 36. You see, that's how you mess, miss problems on an exam. That is terrible. Okay, so let's think about how I could have done this right. Eight plus 28 is 36. Minus eight is not 26, that is 28, right? That's 28. Minus 24 is not two, that's four, which means we have two lone pairs. There you go, almost like I planned it, there we go. So now you see we actually have a lot of stuff around the xenon. Are we worried? No, we're not worried because xenon is a big old atom. It can take more than the octet and it can be perfectly happy, perfectly energetically stable. So that is number one, boom. Are there any non-zero formal charges? Fluorine is seven minus six minus one. That's perfectly happy. Xenon is eight minus four minus four. There are no non-zero formal charges. If you can't do formal charge, you need to make sure you can do it. Go back and review. Now we've got one, two, three, four, five, six EDRs, or the steric number is six. If that's the case, we can draw this as an octahedral, right? And I, the way I draw an octahedral may be a little bit different than the book does it because I am lazy. I like to work smart, not hard. I'm gonna draw the four fluorines in the plane of the paper. And then I'm gonna put something behind the plane, which I'll just put that non-bonding pair back there. And I'll put one in front of the paper. Everything's 90 degrees. That is an octahedral. Oh, wait a minute, uh-huh. There you go. 6 EDR is what? Octahedral EDR geometry, right? That's really important. That's EDR geometry. We want, and this is really important, you want the molecular geometry. The molecular geometry, you kind of hide the lone pairs. So if you hide the lone pairs, and a lot of you had a hard time with this, you hide the lone pairs and you only look at it and you say, okay, those are four fluorines in a square and that square is in the plane of the paper. See the way I drew it there? It paid off now. Planar. That's really important. This was in one of the in-class activities, so there you go. So there we go, we got both draw and name it. Good deal. Any deviations from ideal? In this case, no, these are all gonna be 90 degrees, just like a normal octahedron, right? We could sit there and say that. And you might say, well, wait a minute, don't these, don't these non-bonding electrons push harder? Yeah, but guess what? One is behind the plane, one's in front of the plane, so they push as hard as they want to, but they cancel each other out. So no deviation. So we say no deviation for bond angles. And then the last one, label each as polar, nonpolar. Okay, well, fluorine is really, really electronegative. And so we can say, okay, well, and I know xenon's kind of tough, you know, that's a tough one for the, uh, the table, it's really not shown, but you pretty much know fluorine is really electronegative. Even if there was a polarity difference here, guess what, they all cancel because this is perfectly symmetrical, so this would be nonpolar. Doesn't really matter. There we go, a lot of stuff there. Make sure we did everything that was asked and we're good there. Um, so in this case, I mean, just some of you had a question like, what are you talking about? Well, if, if these four bonds had been polar, you know, you could say, okay, let's say the you said fluorine's the most electronegative, right? We're not going to get into electro electronegativity of noble gas right now. I don't, I don't have the time to do that. Uh, but for right now, we'll just say if there was polarity here, it would be offset because the polarity of this one's directly opposite of it. Same for these two. So even if there was some polarity, it would cancel it out, and there's no polarity net. No, there's no net polarity for the molecule. There we go. Okay, so this next one. We've got sulfur, which is six plus 21. It's an anion, so plus one more. So it's 22 plus six. This time I hopefully can count correctly, which is 28, look at that. And we're gonna say, okay, Lewis structure first. We're gonna have the three fluorines. 
minus 6. That gives us a good old 22. Go around the horn here, give everybody an octet. Everybody needs an octet. Everybody deserves an octet to be happy. There we go. Minus 20, or sorry, minus 18, excuse me. And then uh, what does that do here? Oh, goodness me. Look at that mess. What do we got here? Make sure we calculate that right. 28 minus 6 is 22 minus 18. That's 1, 2. That is, that is 4 electrons. Look at that. So four electrons, which is, in my book, two lone pairs on the sulfur. You might be freaked out, but guess what? Sulfur does not give to three Fs about this because it is another big atom that does not care about breaking the octet rule. Going big is fine for sulfur. However, we do need to make sure we write that this is an anion, and we probably do need to label all non-zero formal charges. Fs uh, are seven minus six minus one, that is zero. Sulfur is six minus four minus three. There we go, we found the negative charge. You knew there had to be one because this whole thing is negative one. And then we can say what? We got, uh, there are what? One, two, three, four, there are five EDRs, right? Which means the EDR geometry, you don't have to write this, but the EDR geometry is something cool to keep track of. That is gonna be our trigonal by pyramidal, right? And we can draw that. And we can say sulfur in the middle. We can say that we've got one back there, one back there, and one even. Uh, our lone pairs always go in the equatorial position. That's really important whenever you have this case, right? Because you have axial and equatorial. And then we put the atoms in the axial and then the one equatorial that's left over. We'll still go ahead and draw that anion. And if you look at this and we don't look at the um, lone pairs, the molecular geometry is simply Mr. T-shaped, right? There we go, T-shaped, because it looks like a letter T. And here we can say what? we Are there going to be deviations? Well, you would expect this angle to be 90, but I promise you these lone pairs are going to push a little bit harder, and this bond angle is actually going to be what? It is going to be uh, less than 90. So yes, there are deviations due to the lone pairs. And then finally, is it polar? Yeah, I think so, because the fluorine is here. It's going to be more electronegative than sulfur, so it's going to be pulling away from the sulfur. If you want to draw the bond dipole, it looks kind of like that, kind of like that. And then these two will cancel each other out, just kind of like we talked about over there. But this one has nothing against it, so we're going to say, yeah, this bond is polar. So yeah, this is a polar molecule, because there's nothing to balance this one out. Yeah, you can make some arguments about the lone pairs, but we're not going to do that right now. We're going to say that if you just look at the bonding disparities, the polar bonds, these two cancel each other out. However, this one definitely points in a net direction. So the overall direction of the polarity of this molecule is al along this sulfur fluorine bond, I believe. There we go. That's a lot. The last thing we have here is another sketch question. It says, OK, draw the following bonds formed from two sp2 hybridized carbons. This is really important. Remember, if you have sp2, that's because you took a s plus a p plus another p. And when you get those together, you get three sp2 hybrid orbitals, right? You go from atomic orbitals to hybrids. And that's really important. And if you think about sp2, what's the bond angle you get from sp2? sp2 gives you 120 degrees, and it looks like this. 120 degrees. That's really important. However, in this case, we don't really care about the overall molecular geometry. We just want some simple examples. So a sigma bond formed between two carbons with sp3 are going to have two of these. So let's go ahead and draw just one lobe. I'll just pick one. And I'll say, OK, I'm going to draw this one and an sp, right? This is an sp2 orbital because we're adding all these together. And we have another sp2 orbital. There we go. And each of these has one electron in it. So the overlap is right there. And if you think about it, right, the nucleus would be right here. So this would be carbon. This would be carbon right here. So right, that's the nucleus. There's a nucleus right there. And then the bond, so here's our nucleus. Here's our nucleus, is right between the two. That is a sigma bond. A sigma bond is denoted or demonstrated by the fact that you have overlap between the nuclei that you're talking about that are being bound together through this chemical bond. 
really important. The pi bond, on the other hand, is a little bit different. Notice here that we had sp2. Again, we had an s plus a p plus a p. What was left over? Well, there is one s orbital. There's one, two, there should be three p orbitals, which means there's one p orbital left over. The p orbital that's left over is not hybridized. So it's going to remain as a regular p orbital. And if you have this, where you have a nucleus and a nucleus, right? Here's our carbon, here's our carbon. The over and below overlap of, right? This is going to be P. This is going to be P. This one I already labeled as sp2 and sp2. Let's label the orbitals, right? So two P orbitals are going to give you overlap above and below. Notice here, here's my carbon nucleus. Here's my carbon nucleus. That, that pi bonding is not between the nuclei, it's above and below, and we call that a pi bond. So these are exactly like cheap imitations of the really beautiful textbook images you have in your notes and in your textbook. So I know my drawing is not uh, stellar, but I hope it's helped you to maybe visualize what I'll be looking for on problems of this type on the exam. I've also tried to highlight places where people make very common mistakes so you don't do the same thing. It's really important here. I think this is a great opportunity for you to earn lots of points on this exam and bring your scores up in the class. I know you can do it, but you've got to really, this is a detail exam. You've really got to be careful, number one, to answer the question that I give you, not the question you hoped I'd write. I want you to answer the question I give you, all the parts. If it says label something, make sure to label it. I try to break these things down to, into little baby steps so you can kind of check off what you need to do. Um, but again, don't leave anything blank. Get your partial credit. You don't have to do the exam in order. Make sure you do the questions that you think are, are easier for you first. Build some confidence. And again, you got to be able to do this in a reasonable amount of time. You know ballpark how quickly you have to work on an exam. If you're not ready to work that quickly, you're just not ready for the exam. So you've got to build some confidence. Work problems. Go back to your in-class activities. Go back to the problems I gave you on the notes. Go back to the smart work. Look at your, your textbook. You have so many extra problems. Have a friend write some extra problems for you. Close the door to your room. Um, time yourself. You know, don't don't use your notes. Don't um, don't have Facebook or Instagram open and listening to music. Pretend it's an exam format. Put yourself under pressure, and I promise you can begin to fight that test anxiety. Otherwise, um, I wish you the best. I again, I I think I've proven myself. I do not make my exams overly hard. I think they are challenging but fair. They see if you've mastered material to earn an A, and you know um, it's Wabash, so I want to challenge you. But at the same time, I want to be fair, and I think for those that are paying attention, you've seen that I've oftentimes used problems or types of problems that have come from the practice problems or the homework problems to reward those of you that are working hard. So I'm trying my best, and I know you're trying hard, so hopefully it'll come together and you can earn some big points on the exam on Friday. Uh, mole day Friday, exam day Friday. Um, do your best. That's all I can ask. So thank you very much. Stay strong and we'll get through this and semester will be done before we know it. So take care.